Hello and welcome to Into You, the podcast where I take a deep dive into getting to know the best you. My name is Adam Strawn and it is my absolute pleasure to speak with one of my favorite people of elite status. He is the host of Slayfest 98 podcast, as well as the co-host of My Bloody Judy and My Nudie Judy, the latter being a Patreon exclusive, so go and sign up to Slayfest 98's Patreon right the hell now. He is also a freelance writer, and he's written articles for such sites as BuzzFeed and Junkie. And he probably, well, by probably, I mean he definitely is the biggest Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan in New Jersey, USA, where he currently resides. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Mr. Ian Carlos Crawford. How are you doing, my lovely? Hi, Adam. I'm okay. How are you? Yeah, you know, I'm really good. Thank you. Really, really warm. It's a bit of a heat wave in the UK right now, but apart from that, I'm doing really, really well. Thank you. Uh, what have you been up to this week? I feel like there's a heat wave everywhere because it's been really fucking hot here. Too. Like the um, Yeah, like global warming has shown up. <laughs> there was like a monsoon last night, though. So I'm hoping that cooled. I haven't been outside yet today, but I'm hoping that cooled <laughs> stuff down. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I've been okay. Uh, yeah, you know, how about you? Long and long. Uh, yeah, you know what? I've like, so I'm off work for two weeks now. So I've timed it really, really well because the weather is like amazing. And I had to put in these holidays like back at the start of the year. So I had no idea. I was like, oh, I've got two years, uh, two years, two weeks. Imagine being off work for two years, two weeks. And I was like, ah, I'll just put them in like around this time. It's my birthday in July. I'll just throw them in and see what happens. And then it's timed perfectly. So yeah, I've been catching up with friends, been catching up with family. I went to the park today, played a little bit of badminton completely randomly. Um, but yeah, it's been really fun. Just, I was like, so I was like a hot mess before I got back here to the flat. So I quickly changed and I'm wearing the correct t-shirt for today, which by the way, this is not official merch. So everybody don't jump into Ian's DMs and ask, where did you get that t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> this is a red bubble number. One day I'll have t-shirts. I constantly am like, okay, this is the weekend. I'm going to try to find out how to do t-shirts. and then I do. <laughs> That weekend will come and I'll own like a whole wardrobe full of them. I'm not <laughs> even joking. <laughs> In like, every I, ha I have like new stuff I bought designs of even the dolly parton design i feel like will would do well on a t-shirt but yeah. i just uh, i don't want to have like st I, the pins i have like in containers stacked underneath my desk and i'm like where would i put t-shirts <laughs> so it's gotta be like one of those sites that will like print it for you as i don't know yeah, then it's, yeah. Ugh, i don't know i know there's a, there's a lot to sort out right a lot of admin to sort out with that but yeah you can just imagine like to the right of you there there's just like a pile of like a thousand t-shirts and more and more <laughs> <laughs> all different colors yeah, so let's talk a little bit about how we met, Ian. Do you remember? Um, I feel like <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's I been think like maybe a, you, it's you been found Slayer thing. Fest, right? Yeah, that was that was it. So kind of it was it was lockdown of 2020, so the first lockdown in the UK. And I think I started to like watch a lot of vlogs and I started to like kind of branch out with podcasts as well. And I was like, right, okay. And then um I was thinking, like, what the hell am I doing? Like, I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer, obviously. But like, I was like, why am I not checking out the podcast? And I kind of looked and I saw a few people tweeting about Slayfest 98. And I was like, okay, what is this? Let's give this a go. And then, yeah, like I started rewatching Buffy anyway through lockdown. And I was like, well, this will be really good because they cover it episode by episode. So I'll listen to an episode while I watch an episode and I'll break through it like that. And then I just fell in love with the podcast. I was like, this is literally my jam. And uh, yeah, I think then I kind of followed you on socials. And then um, I think that when you were tweeting stuff out, I was replying like, oh my God, everything you're saying is correct. And then uh, you were like replying to me and I was like, all right, cool. And I think we just kind of went from there really. And then just started chatting a lot more. And then here we are. Look at us now. Besties. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's fun. So uh, speaking of Slayfest 98, Ian, let's go back. So obviously Slayfest 98, you know, it obviously started as a Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast, but then it obviously did evolve. But let's go back even before that. So let's talk about Buffy, where it all began for you. So baby Ian, yeah. um, when did you first start watching the show? Was it like from day one when the show first aired? Did you get into it later on? Like what was your kind of introduction to Buffy? So I remember when it came out, because my mom, who is not the, a, I always have to clarify this when I tell any like <laughs> folks I have on from the show, I'm like, no, like a 72 year old or 74 year old is not the demographic for Buffy. <laughs> like she was not a teen when it came out, but like my mom just like, I don't know. She always really liked anything with like strong women and stuff. Mm. And I remember her watching it and me being like the nerd who was like, oh, you're watching that show. It looks <laughs> and then like at the end of season two, I can remember her sitting in the kitchen crying watching on our little like box tv we had as buffy killed angel mm. um and i remember that was like the first scene i watched like i remember watching it and like thinking oh she's a really good actor like sarah mm -hmm. geller and oh, yeah. like oh that's kind of cool she had a killer boyfriend i think maybe i want to watch the show my mom was like sobbing and i had no context <laughs> for what 
like what was like going on, but I thought it looked cool. And then the first episode I fully watched was um, Faith, Hope and Trick. Mm, right. Which cool. at the time, because, you know, back then at the time, I thought it was the season premiere of season three, but it wasn't, but like close enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's only a couple of episodes up, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, I love that. And it, I kind of got it with through my family as well. So I remember like, so it was back then, you know, it was kind of like one episode a week, wasn't it? And, you know, I know Disney Plus has done that a lot more now, kind of recently with like Loki and everything else. Yeah. But this was the time when like you had advert breaks and everything like that. So you had to time it right. And that was the time when you'd run to the loo or go for a drink or whatever. Yeah. But I remember coming downstairs and it was every Thursday night at eight o'clock on Sky One in the UK. That's when Buffy aired. And I remember like my family, like my dad, my mom and my older brother were watching it. And I was kind of like, oh, OK, so I was like just a young boy walking downstairs, came in. And I was like, what are you watching? And it was the episode. And Ian, you probably might be able to help me with the title of the episode. But it was the episode when uh, Willow is locked in like a storage room and there's a vampire going to go in and bite her. But then she like raises the pencil and stakes it from behind. Do you remember? Oh, um, is that I think season- that's Choices in season yeah. three. Yeah, it's definitely season three. Isn't that when Faith is... Like, she's what, bad because yeah, that's, that's it. I'm pretty sure it's choices because that's when later on Willow's like, you're actually really worthless and she yeah. punches Willow. But I'm so yeah. proud of Willow for getting you that like in. Oh my god. Yes. Like Will the Willow character. I mean, we'll come to her, but yes, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I remember watching that and I was just like, right, what is this? I need it in my life immediately. And like it was my older brother who kind of like filled it up with the show later when he stopped watching it. But at the time he was really into when he was like, right, okay, Adam, so she's a witch. She's a vampire slayer. She basically she kills all of these things. He's her watcher and just literally like explained everything to me in like literally a hot minute. I was like, right, I am invested. And then <laughs> like, great, got it. <laughs> yeah, got it all. I'm here. Like all caught up. And then like, yeah, and I just started watching. I think I watched it from that point, watched the rest of season three. And I was like, okay, this is a landmark TV. And then kind of went back and bought the first two seasons that were out at the time. Now I remember when I went on a family holiday to Florida. And I saw season three in some like store and I was like, oh my God, there it is. And by the way, the DVD covers in America are so much better than the UK ones. They're like bulky. They've got all these pictures going on. Whereas I was just like, I don't know, it's really thin. Like, you know, it's basic, but I loved it. And I was like, right, got it. And then just got home and just watched it and then just became obsessed from there. But how do you feel like the show itself has impacted you? Um, well, one, I just wanted to say I quick. So because I keep up. I mean, this is bad for my computer, but I keep up. There's like 85 tabs related to the podcast that I keep up all the time. <laughs> and it. one of them is the Wikipedia list of all the Buffy episodes. And it is definitely choices. I just looked up. To Brilliant. See. Um, that's so wild. That, that was your first episode because it's like three before the finale. I know, um, right? <laughs> crazy. I'm like, but I was just caught up. Right. Yep. I mean, I've got it all. Well, and in, in the UK, they didn't they didn't delay graduation day. Right. In the UK, because nope. in America, they did because of like school shootings. Yeah, of course. Um, and I remember like that made me so weirdly that made me fall out with the show because I was like, oh, no, I want to wait till I can catch that finale. And I thought I had just missed it. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, when you miss it, it's kind of like, well, we'll see if I ever see it again. Um, yeah. And I remember like at first, I don't think I ever actually saw it till they brought. Did they have those VHS tapes in the UK where it was only like actually six episodes from yeah. the season? But it would yeah. say like seasons one, two and three, but it was only like six episodes. <laughs> yeah. I remember buying the VHS tapes of that and it had the finale on it and like a couple Mm. other random episodes and then i found out willow was gay and that's it's like i missed most of season four and then once i heard that she was gay i went back to like i was like okay now i'm definitely gonna watch this again yeah season five was when i think i can't remember if it was season five or six when i was like okay to like curtail me missing episodes i'm just gonna have a vhs tape taping it every single episode yeah um i i mean it's like lame, but like Buffy definitely changed my life in most aspects of like how I view things, how I want to write. Mm. Um, I always feel like the characters I write, I always want them to feel because, right, we love Buffy because of the characters. We don't love it just because it's they're killing vampires. Like people yeah. will joke with me like, oh, vampires are your brand. And it's like, well, no, not really. It's Buffy. That's my br-. like, yeah, I don't love all vampire things. I just love Buffy. Mm-hmm. Um And for me, I liked that it was, I think like even watching it, it was a big deal for me that she was like a vampire slayer, but you know, we had glory, we had the mayor, we had villains that weren't just vampires. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And it was just, especially for the time. And I mean, it still is right. This is why you and I love it. It's so well done and well written, well acted. Mm -hmm. Um, It taught me that you could take that genre seriously with still being like funny. Like there's still episodes where you're just laughing and there's nothing like super serious. Yeah. Um, but you know, then when characters die, it's 
it takes it, it it doesn't just be like oh, well that character's dead no big deal like we <laughs> see the characters mourn we see yeah. them like you know buffy go, or giles goes to get revenge when miss calendar's you know we see uh-huh. shit like that and willow yeah. does the same thing um and i think yeah it like made me want to write almost because i felt especially back then we didn't have a lot of shows like this right no no. Um, we didn't have like a lot of superhero stuff either and this was kind of like i had i remember back in the day a lot of like the writing about it would say like it was the closest to an x-men tv show and i think i always think about that and i can't remember where i read that but i do (laughs) think that's really accurate because i loved the x-men cartoon Mm. and then like that was my favorite thing. Literally, there wasn't another show I loved as much until Buffy, like I started watching Buffy. Yeah. Um, and I feel like those two kind of go hand in hand, right? Yeah, no, 100%. You can see why someone who loves one would also love the other. Yeah. Um, you know, and I get, I've gotten a lot of X-Men fans on the podcast, um, people who've written comics, whatever, mm. um, that are big Buffy fans and do credit it with like how they want to write. And I think a lot of people... Um, of our age group Adam (laughs) do feel that way right like and it was you know when we had Jaina Spenson on she talked about the first time we had her on for season four she talked about how Buffy kind of was like a queer metaphor until it was explicitly queer and she felt that's why it had a lot of LGBTQ fans and I agree with that 100% Mm -hmm. right yeah Buffy has a coming out speech with her mom and it's yeah I feel like when you if you tell someone who maybe is queer and maybe has never watched Buffy out of context, it might sound tacky, but watching it, you're like, no, this is really well done. Yeah. It takes itself seriously. It's not like making fun of coming out. It's yeah. You know, right. It's done really well. I mean, one of the, one of the strongest things in the writing for Buffy for me, but I've never seen anything else is metaphor. So like that scene is metaphor through and through, you know, Buffy is talking about like, coming out as a vampire slayer really to her mother Joyce, but the reality is the subtext is there and the metaphor is there for coming out. You know, that's yeah. essentially what that scene is and that's why it works so well. But again, it's a thing like when you talk about the characters and everything like that, like every single fight that we see that Buffy has or any other character has, there is metaphor underlying there. You know, we get the metaphor of like Willow using magic with drug use later on in season six. You know, we get all of this metaphor and it's such clever writing. I think one of the big things for me as well is like watching Buffy at that age. I had seen, you kind of said this as well, Ian, I'd seen nothing like that at the time. I was like, oh my God, this TV show, which is creating its own Buffy verse, which I'd never seen, you know, ever creating its own mythology. Yes, it had vampires and everything like that, but it was creating its own mythology around that as well. And then when Angel came along as well, you know, and then we started having the shows run in parallel with one another, we had two shows existing in the same universe. And that's like a massive impact where we look at things like, you know, the Arrow universe, for example, you know, just to pick one out of the air, you know, that does the same thing now, but Buffy was landmark in doing that years before this even existed. So, you know, you'd see characters from Angel come over into Buffy, you'd see characters from Buffy go over into Angel, and that shit, I just ate up. I was like, oh my God, I love that stuff. It's so clever, and I just, I ate up. And I always find, for me, some of my favorite episodes is when characters go over into the other TV shows and vice versa, which I'm sure we could talk about for hours. But yeah, just... Characters so well written, not necessarily archetypes as well, which I really loved. We got all different dimensions. Buffy was a vampire slave, but she was also a young girl just trying to get through high school with the biggest burden in the world on her shoulders, you know? And then, you know, we've got like other, it could be very, very cheesy. We could just have Willow, who's like the high school geek, Xander, who's the jock. But then as time goes on, we get so many more layers to these characters. And, you know, we had other TV shows at the time that kind of just riffed off those characters being, you know, one kind of level and everyone kind of like, oh, that's the character. We kind of knew what they were going to say. We knew what they were going to do. Yeah. But it's the decisions and everything that we see these characters do throughout the whole series. And even now, like when we watch stuff, we still get shocked by it and go, wow, like they did that. They went there. They they really went there. And the evolution of some of the characters is just so, oh, so well done. So yeah, it's just, for me, it's, it's landmark. And again, like going into like, you know, it's mark on pop culture. There's still like, you know, even now, some of my friends will say, like, if we're watching something like a TV show and there's a female heroine who's kicking ass, it could be, you know, like, could be kicking ass with a demon or fighting something. The first reference every time is, oh, she's like Buffy. You know what I mean? That That is the that is the effect of pop culture. You know, anyone who kind of hears the name Buffy or Buffy, Buffy the Vampire Slayer knows exactly what that brand is and gets what you're talking about. You, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, like, totally. I mean... When my mom and I saw Captain Marvel, Mm -hmm. I made her do like a Patreon episode with me talking about it. And she said like, oh, I feel like a lot of it was owed to Buffy. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) I mean, my mom, it's so funny because my mom loves Buffy, but she doesn't, she's not someone who like 
she would rewatch reruns if they were on, but she doesn't like watch DVDs or anything. Yeah. So she forgets a lot of the show, <laughs> but it, she remembers it's a, a show that she loved and that she loves Cordelia and Spike. Those are my mom's favorites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, good choices. <laughs> but like, you know, even without remembering specific things, my mom was like, I feel like it owes a lot to Buffy. And I was like, mm -hmm. I, I kind of do too, even though, again, like you said, it's like, it's the not fighting demons, but it still feels like it's like a badass woman. And when we get that scene of her standing up, like that was very Buffy to me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, and I go back to my mom said that the, what drew her to Buffy was that Buffy could like still be cute, still like worry about fashion, but still be the serious hero. And that she yes. liked that a lot. Mm. Um, and I, you know, my mom, I, I don't know that I've talked about this with her, but I think a lot about like, I think we talk about this a lot nowadays where like queerness or femininity sometimes has to be sacrificed to yeah. be the main character or to be the hero. Right. Yeah. It's like, Oh, you have to ditch those silly things, but Buffy didn't have to ditch those things. And that yeah. I think is what drew a lot of us to her, especially a lot of queer folks, because it was like, Oh, she still does care about her outfits and that doesn't make her stupid or, <laughs> you know, like she could still be this badass hero, but she still wants to look cute. All right. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. And even when you look at like Cordelia, who is very much focused on that, you know, she wants to look basically banging every time you see her and believe me, she, she does. does. <laughs> she, I mean, hello, like charisma carton and knocks out the park every time. <laughs> But I love that even with the character of Cordelia, you know, we look at by the end of, you know, even that one episode of season five of Angel that she's in, she's a completely different character by that time. But yet the evolution of like, even just the seeds of the Cordelia character is still there. Even just her final line, the way she delivers that, like, oh, and you're welcome. You know, it's it's such a Cordelia delivery. But yet that character has gone through so much to get to that point. And it's just, again, that's what I mean, like that writing and that care with the characters to making them feel so real. And that they're not just kind of like, you know, messing with, they're not just there to promote something. They're there to actually live through the series and you follow them and just believe them. That's why we're still talking about them right now, Ian. You know, like we still love yeah. Cordelia because of the impact she's had. We still love Buffy. We still love all of these characters, right? I mean, even speaking of Cordelia, like the first season, they do try to like make her more of just the mean girl. But by the end, I think of like by the season finale when Miss mm. Calendar and Willow are running out. And they run into her car and like, we need to get to the library. And she's like, got it. And she just yeah. crashes through the wall and she's like, all right, I'm going to help. And yeah. so often that was how Cordelia would be where she, she was more concerned with like the fashion and the like hierarchy of high school, but she also still, when she needed to was like, yeah, I'm going to help. Yeah. All right, cool. Like, Actually. No, I love that. Even in that episode, you know, when season one of like Buffy, you know, we get a lot of like, like this episode where Cordelia's tied up or like Cordelia's in trouble and she needs rescue. And then even is it is it season two or season three? I forget when, you know, it must be season three when um Buffy and Cordelia are put through like the gauntlet and like everybody thinks it's like Buffy and Faith, but it's actually Buffy and Cordelia. Slayer Fest 98 episode. Yes, of course. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, of course. And then that last part when Buffy's obviously knocked out and Cordelia just steps up to that vampire. That for me was like the evolution of the character. At that point, I was like, right, this girl's got it going on. Yeah, and she yeah. ain't taking any shit. And <laughs> even that was just what, in like three seasons, let alone everything else that we got after that. So yeah, just the way it's handled characters all the way through time, it's it's revolutionary. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. And I am absolutely here for it. <laughs> and the thing I will say too is, I know we talked a lot about the writing, but I do think it was like a perfect storm of writing and acting. Yes. Um because like lesser actors wouldn't have been able to deliver a lot of those lines no. with like conviction. It could have just, you know, no, no like shade or anything, <laughs> love and light, but like but. charmed <laughs> 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 while I'm sure it, it, it's enjoyable. And it was something I would watch as a background sometimes, but like, mm. you know what I mean? That was like, uh, I get what you're saying. You know, yeah. <laughs> you won't feel in the power of three every single episode. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Charmed had its moments, I have to say, but Buffy for me delivered every, you know, pretty much every single time. Yeah. But yeah, I get that. So, oh my God, I could talk about Buffy all day, Ian, but I, I digress. Let's continue. Uh, so, yeah, Ian, the writer, let's have a little dip into that. So, Ian, obviously you were working at BuzzFeed and you were writing articles and, you know, in general. Like, so what type of articles were you writing back then? And what, what kind of stuff do you focus on and write now? Like, has there been an evolution of your own writing? Um, you know, I. I actually just, I just recently had someone say something snobby to me about BuzzFeed. They're like, oh, why did you work there if you want to be a writer? And it was like, what are you, stupid? Like, they were like, oh, all they do is write lists. I was like, that is such an outdated view of BuzzFeed. Um, but like, it helped me learn a lot with like, 
social media, with like promoting, with the kind of stuff that does well. Like I, I would find that pieces I spent a long time writing wouldn't get the like numbers that like a stupid piece that was just a bunch of gifts would get. So yeah. every time someone like knocks Buzzfeed for that, I'm like, yeah, but that's what people click on. That's what you know, doing. like I can, yeah, there's yeah. nothing I can do about that. There's nothing they can do about that. Like, no. so of course they're going to want to put out more of the stuff people click on. Yeah. Fucking duh. <laughs> um, so I don't like knock them. And I always remember at one of the meetings, I think it was Jonah Peretti said like, we think of ourselves as a TV station. You can have the news, you can have a reality show, you can mm. have, you know, a sitcom. And I always, I like think while I, I don't even think he works with the company. I don't know. But like, I do think that was a good way of thinking. Um, mm. And that's kind of like, I try to apply that to Slayer Fest 98. Like, okay, like that's almost what I thought when we started branching out. Like, okay, Buffy's maybe was our main thing, but like, we can talk Marvel. We can talk Carly Quinn. We can talk, mm. you know, movies and shit like that. Yeah. Um, because I think that's a good way to look at it where it's like, we can have the serious stuff. But we also can have the fluff and we're gonna throw it all out there and see what works. Um, but yeah, no, I worked, I interned there. I was only an intern and okay. it was for five months, six months. I can't remember. Mm. Um, and it was working for, at the time they had all the different verticals. Yeah. So I worked for, I was the intern for the geeky vertical. Of course. Um, and I gotta say, so in that time I worked Comic-Con and working Comic-Con when you're with Buzzfeed is wild. <laughs> you can get like any interview you want. Oh, if wow. You're emailing from a Buzzfeed account. Yeah. So much so that people are emailing you to interview them because they know you work for Buzzfeed. Oh, wow. Um, that was the first interview I ever did was Amber Benson. And it was because her agent saw that I wrote a lot about Buzzfeed and emailed me to interview her. And I was like, <gasps> Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> and she was like the, anytime I have her on the podcast, I mean, it's only been three times, but like anytime I have only? her on, we always <laughs> like, I'm always like, it's wild Amber that you were the first interview. Like I had ever done. So I hadn't ever interviewed people before Buzzfeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she was the first interview I ever did. My recorder was dead and I didn't realize it. <laughs> so I had to record on my phone. She was so nice. And she was like, it's fine. Don't worry. It's no big deal. Yeah. Um, and even afterwards, she was like, can we take a selfie? And I was like, I didn't want to ask, but yes, I do want to take one. <laughs> that was going to be my first question. Yeah. <laughs> because I was like, oh, I feel like that's like maybe like inappropriate or whatever. But the moment she said it, I was like, yes, I would love to. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Wow. Oh, my God. Like all those doors that opened up immediately. Like I'm a Benson, man. Jesus. Like that's incredible. I would just... I'm she still has the same agent and I'm like, we're friendly. We're friends. We like sometimes get drinks when I'm in L.A. And she's the same agent for Jana Spenson and a couple other people. And that's like how I slowly started getting those people on the podcast. Yeah, no, I love that. And then, oh my God, like actually talking to Tara, like, oh my God. Like, I know that obviously she's an actress. She's done like incredible other things. She's written a lot of things as well. And you kind of like, for me, I'd be like, okay, that's all fantastic. But I just want to ask you like 50,000 questions about Buffy. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure she'd be lovely about it. But, but the thing is, she is. Yeah, yeah she's yeah. so nice about it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, she's she's incredible. I really, really have a lot of time for Emma Benson. But yeah, so like, you know, compared to those articles then, like, so you still do fr like freelance writing now, right? So what type of articles are you writing now, Ian, compared to then? So I try to do like, working for the DT Vertical, it was a lot of lists, right? Um, yeah. And I mean, I like I interviewed, I interviewed some other cool people. The interviews just never did as well, honestly, okay. like. The Amber Benson interview, I will say, did pretty well. And I'm bummed. I recently went to look back at the, you know, it was so long ago at this point. I'm sure they've changed their file hosting format or whatever since yeah. then. Because my Amber Benson interview, it was all pictures. And it was fuck, marry, kill, Buffy characters. And so Love. she would hold up a whiteboard with them on it. Um, yeah. And those pictures like went around Tumblr for like a really long time. And it made oh, me wow. happy every time I saw them. <laughs> but now if you go to the article, it just is like an X where the photos were, mm. I guess, because, you know. Yeah. Um, but like that did well, but other interviews that were just text, oh boy, did those not do well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I try to like make it a mix. Like right now I'm not freelancing anywhere. If someone wants to hire me, hire me. Uh, mm. But uh, so I wrote for New Now Next a lot. Um, and I would try to make it like a mix of like, you know, like one piece I wrote for them was like uh, the best, the rank, uh, like definitive ranking of the Will and Grace holiday episodes. Okay. Um, and so I ranked all the holiday episodes, but like I would still do more writing than just a list. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I try to like 
find a middle ground. Mm. Um, but like last year, I wrote a piece that I was actually really proud of um, called Seeking Validation at the End of the World. I think that's what it was called. I don't fucking know. Um, <laughs> for Noon and X. And it was an essay about kind of like looking for validation online and during the pandemic um, and kind of about how like, I, I it was like existing online and like feeling like, oh, but like everyone else is like saying they want to fuck each other and no one's saying that to me. I feel bad about myself. I want validation. And like, yeah. I think a lot of people can relate to that where it's like, tell me you like my things that I make, but also tell me that I'm attractive. Um, mm. And, you know, I realize that's very bratty, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, if it gets them hits, right? If it gets people reading, but no, it's like, it's so nice that, you know, you, you know, you were talking earlier about Buffy influence and your writing style and everything like that. And it's nice that you were able to pick out those, those articles and find the middle ground, you know, like you do get a lot of articles that you see where it is list, or it's just like, you know, top 10 videos of this thing or whatever it may be. And it's nice that you kind of went for that middle ground and thought, you know what? I have, although like, you know, people are asking me to do this and want this. I've still got my own voice, you know, and I still want to put my own stamp on this. And I think that's really important and really integral when you're writing anything, really, that some of your own personality still shows through because it's your work at the end of the day. You know, it's really easy just to collect like a top 10 list of videos together and be like, there it is. It's all out there. You could have done this, but there you go. It's on a website. Click on it. But, you know, you were well, still putting your own stuff in there. That's funny because, yeah, there was a site that I won't say that I wrote mm -hmm. for that did not pay well at all. Okay. And they would every time I wrote something, they would edit it to shit where like my voice wasn't there. It uh, sounded super mechanical Yeah, and it didn't pay well. So I was like, I'm not going to write for this. And I just kind of stopped emailing them back. Mm. Um, and they were like a crazy news factory where I'd be like, you have to, they would like, you had to have the exact word count. And like, I wasn't, I said, God damn in two pieces. And I got a letter, an email from one of the head editors being like, we need you to stop cursing. And I was like, <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like, Did you write back like for fuck's sake? <laughs> yeah, I was just like, uh, um, and like, th but hilariously, the my BuzzFeed piece that did the best, I think it's the only one I had that hit like a million views. Oh, wow. Was just a list of, do you remember when Nick Jonas did those like sexy photo shoots? I mean, of no, are, no, yeah. uh, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, I never saw that. <laughs> no, let me close uh, this browser. <laughs> it literally was just those pictures with like thirsty gifts attached to them and that was the best like the the most views a post i've ever done ever got mm. um and it was you know took me five seconds so much so that it took me five fucking seconds to do that when he did his second photo shoot his people emailed me high-res versions of the photos oh wow for whatever other magazine it was that he posed for mm. they were like oh we'd love for you to cover this as well because like even they noticed how well that piece, stupid piece with gifts did. Mm. And I mean, it's still, I think it was like my second most viewed piece was when I did the second one. Um, and that takes like five seconds to do. Yeah. Wow, okay. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like Nick Jonas has a very special place in my heart. Um, yeah, I could talk about him for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, but you know- He's was... very attractive. And I met him in person when he came into the office. <laughs> what was he like? Very quiet. Very really? quiet. Yeah. It was before I had done those posts, which I'm always so bummed about because I feel like I could have been like, hey, yeah, hi. Take a look like, at this. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it was on his birthday and he, he was doing, I think he was doing like a video for BuzzFeed of like him making his favorite cocktails. Um, oh, yeah. So sometimes if there was a celebrity, they would let us take selfies with them. But sometimes if there was like a time crunch and they were very famous, mm. it would be, you're doing a group photo. There's yeah. no like single selfies because everyone would be in line. So yeah. it was a group photo with him. Literally, I'm like in line. Everyone's lining up next to him. And his one of his people is like, oh, people can kneel down in front. There's room in front. <laughs> I will say I was the first person on my knees in front of him. So I am literally right in front of him on my knees. Um, and when I got up, it was his birthday. And I was like, oh, happy birthday. And he was like, thanks, thanks. And I was like, how was it? And he was like, well, I did a lot of things. I got a lot of attention. And I was like, well, that's no different than any other day for you, right? <laughs> and this is such a weird, I don't even, I don't know why this happened, but he laughed, lifted up his arm to put it on my like shoulder, but stopped halfway and then just put his arm back. So literally just like, okay, it's like a slow motion high five, but. It, but I didn't even realize it happened because of the way I was standing and everyone else was like, did you see what he did? He went to put his arm on you, but then like stopped halfway. And I was like, oh, really? Did that just happen? <laughs> yeah. So oh, wow. that's my Nick Jonas story. And I'll send you the picture later. It's literally me. I'm kneeling right in front of it. <laughs> that was going to be my next one. Like, Ian, the camera's, the camera's this way. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh my God. So yes, that was going to be my next request. Send me that photo. I need to see it immediately. But, uh, I saw him. So I was in New York in 2014 and uh, it was the Macy's parade. And I remember Nick Jonas went by and I was just like, oh my God. I was like, Nick Jonas, you know, hello, I love you. I, I clicked on an article that Ian wrote 10,000 times. <laughs> he is really hot, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, he's a babe. He's an absolute babe. I could talk about him a lot, but uh, we digress. Um, so yeah, so you're still... Now, Ian, you and I obviously talk outside of this as well. And you've hinted to me that you have got a few ideas that you're still throwing around for your own writing, you know, your own personal storytelling writing. How are you with that? You know, have you still got some stories that you're dying to tell? You're still writing stuff down? How are you doing with that? Um, well, uh, lately, <laughs> my like adult ADD, which I do have, I don't say that like cutely, I do have it. Um, I find that when I try to sit down and write, because it's like, you know, the last time I sat down with my horror novel I spent like hours and I ended up only writing two paragraphs because I had read so I was reading and editing yeah. like the last 20 pages so then I looked and I'm like well it feels like I have nothing to show for those like you know hours I just spent on this and I feel like my ADD brain is like nope this is taking too much time there are other things for your podcast you could be doing mm. which sucks because I do want to do both yeah. um, but I do have trouble like concentrating on the writing these days um, but I do have a horror novel I would love to finish and get out there. I have two books that I wrote that went nowhere. Um, one was nonfiction collection of essays and one was um, fiction uh, kind of about, I worked at the Museum of Sex in New York for a year. I wanted to write a nonfiction book about working there. I literally wrote one chapter and was like, I don't have a plot to this. Hmm. I just have like stories. So I made that first chapter like the first chapter of that book is still almost almost word for word what really happened yeah um, i just like changed the names and who was there and then i kind of made it like a supernatural fiction book from there and i have like a book trailer for it but it went nowhere it would be nice <laughs> if it got published um but yeah i had more luck with the essays um david sedaris's agent at one point was interested and then she turned me down but it ah. was cool to have someone interested yeah definitely no i think it's one of the things isn't it when like you know you think of like some of the great right it's like stephen king for example you know he famously didn't he throw carrie in the bins he thought it was utter rubbish and then it was his wife who picked out and was like actually i think you need to take this and get it published you know and then obviously carrie went on to do amazing things and i think even king says and like if you read his book like on writing mm -hmm. Yeah. And he even says in there, like, don't be so protective of stuff. Like he tears out pages of his own writing and throws away and starts again, keeps writing this. I mean, he does have the luxury of when he can like, you know, sit and just write and write and write, but he makes a habit of it, I guess, and just does that all the time. And that's one of the hardest things I think for me as well. Cause I've, I've kind of got a novel that I keep going back to, keep chipping away at, but I, I'm one of those people and it annoys me so much. It annoys me when I do it myself, when I'll write like a line, but that line has to be perfect. And I'll go back and edit that line like three times and I can't move on until that line is perfect. And then I'm like, the next line, I'm like, Adam, what are you doing? Like, you know, and what you were saying there, you spend two hours on two paragraphs. That's literally me. I completely empathize with you because that is me. Like, I'll write one line and I'll be like, right, okay, you know that line that you wrote like 10 minutes ago? Let's go back and just read it again. Right. <laughs> it's just a continuous spiral of that. So, yeah, I think um, it's one of the things that, you know, you just, I think you just have to make part of your, yeah, just a habit of it, really. And even if you do 100, you know, word, like 100 words a day, it's 100 more than what you did yesterday. And it could be utter shit. But at least you're hopefully making progress in some way. But yeah, I'm dying to know more about the uh, horror novel itself. So can you, anything you want to share about that? Oh, um, I mean, yeah. Uh, I always think of um, what happens after the horror movie. Like that's what I'm always like thinking of. Mm. Um, it's a thing I like about the Scream series is we do get to see Gail and Sydney kind of like, I mean, granted the movies are always them thrown back in, but we get to see where they are. Yeah where they've been since or whatever. Um, and I'm always interested in that, right? Because yeah. after, especially after my friend passed away, right? I thought of a lot of like trauma in relation to that because, you know, not too long after that, my grandma passed away and it's like life still goes on and you still have other bad things that happen even when there's the worst thing that happened. Yeah. Other bad things still continue to happen. Life still like goes on. So I'm always interested in that story. So basically I wanted to write a YA horror novel but I wanted to write something where I could like relate to the PTSD of something like the worst thing happened, but then the rest of life still happens and you're depressed and you still have to like keep moving. Yeah. Um, and how like friendships break up because of these things. And like, you know, it, it does kind of like you think about it every day. So I was like very interested in telling that story. And I kind of was like, I can't write this nonfiction because I wrote 
the essay about finding my friend um, for BuzzFeed. And I kind of just didn't want to write a longer thing about that. So I was like, well, let me make this fiction and I can relate like my experiences into like a horror movie. Cause I felt like that was the worst day of my, that is the worst day of my life. So like, you know, I wanted to write something, something about kind of like that. And so I made it horror. I have like the present narrative is like the final girl going through just like boring life. And she has a grandma she's very close with who is dying. Um, but then all the flashbacks are set during the horror movie scenario, which is kind of like a Friday the 13th thing. It's like, there's like a monster who's killing all these teens at a Halloween party. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I've, I've been doing that. And then I'll have some flashbacks that are just like all of the friends being friends from before they died in the horror movie scenario and her like remembering her friends. Um, and yeah, I the thing that I've been having the most trouble when I write that is killing the characters because then yeah. I feel bad. <laughs> You get so attached to them, don't you? Whereas you're not like George R. R. Martin, who's just like, yeah, they'll die. Yeah, like, like, I like this character, but I'm going to behead them. <laughs> yeah, I love this character. They're dead in chapter two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think what I, what I love about that is obviously what you just said there, you know. So, I mean, I guess like when you were writing that article for BuzzFeed as well, that must be really cathartic as well to get all of that out and kind of put it in writing, you know, and kind of like process it in that way as well. But what's interesting as well about your process here for the novel is you've taken that and rather than just kind of reiterating it again in a novel form, you kind of use the experience and you're putting the character of your novel kind of through a similar experience as well. But that's still coming from somewhere where you can relate to because, you know, you have that, you know, horrific incident of losing your, you know, your friend, as you said, and then obviously your grandmother shortly after. But I think it's it, that's, for me, some of the best writing when you take some of that experience, some of that emotion, you put it into like a character is living through that because it makes it so much more real, right? Like it jumps off the page and it's so much more relatable for other people that have had similar experiences, unfortunately, as well, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean... I will say writing the essay wasn't cathartic. Okay. Actually, a reason I didn't want to make it nonfiction is because um, two men that I didn't go on dates with uh, trolled me on Twitter like very hard about the essay. Um, okay. And like, you know, like said I was making myself a victim and blah, blah, blah. And mm. like, you know, a lot of people, I will say even people that like I'm not that close with came to my defense to be like, you're being a fucking asshole to these guys. But like, you know, you always remember the worst part of yeah. something. And yeah. so that's the part I always go back to. Yeah. Um, so that was like a reason why I, that was mostly the reason why I didn't want to revisit it because I was like, oh, I don't want to deal with all these awful people like coming from my personal experiences. So I can just make yeah. a fiction and... And here we are, but no, I can't wait to. Uh, yeah, you know what? Keep writing it though. Like, I'm, it sounds great. And I want to want to read it and I want to sign copy immediately. <laughs> Yeah, our, our friend Zach read like the first 10 pages, I think. Yeah. And he was like, uh, the main character is a lot like you. I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the main character's name? Her name is Jess after Jessica Jones. <laughs> all right. Of course. There she is. I named all of the ladies are named after uh, fictional women I love. Yeah. I mean, let's be real. You're on branding <laughs> and they're all on the back wall behind you. <laughs> yes, <they are. laughs> Love it. Right. Ian, let's jump into your incredible podcast that I'm sporting right here now on my t-shirt. Clayfest 98. So take me right back to the start, Ian. Like, you know, when was it, in, you know, that like you create the podcast and why is it that you wanted to create it? And like, how did you get it off its feet? How did it all begin? Well, the craziest thing is I don't know that it was even my idea. Um, okay. When we started the first episode, we say the name Three Slayers No Waiting. That was yep. the original name. So it was three co-hosts. Mm -hmm. It was me, Matthew Rodriguez, and Joe Reed. Mm -hmm. Joe Reed um, like got a full-time writing job and like literally after we recorded was like, I'm so sorry, I really can't commit to being like a full-time co-host. So I mean, he pretty much stayed a regular, especially for the first few seasons, like he would be on a lot. Um and so it was me and Matthew after that. And then around season five, Matthew like was getting more jobs, got a book deal and just really couldn't commit to like staying on board full time. So the body was his last episode as a full time co-host. Mm -hmm. And by that point, I had had a few episodes where I had people fill in, like if he couldn't do it, I think I had Adam Sass, Kirsten White and then Anthony Oliveira had been fill ins for Matthew. Mm -hmm. um, but then it was like, oh, cool. I'm going to I already have these three people that are like very good you know, when he's not their co-host, I was like pretty confident that I had enough rotating folks in the Slayer Fest family that I could have co-hosts that are rotating. And that's kind of, that's kind of what I wanted. Once he like stepped down, I was like, cool, that's, I don't want anyone who has to be full-time because one, I know that's 
a lot of work to ask someone to do that is making them no money. Yeah. Um, and with the rotating, it makes it easier, you know, like Adam Sass, who is probably co-host the most, you know, he, he had a book deadline during Falcon and Winter Soldier. So he just couldn't do that. And then I bumped up Stephanie Williams, who had been on for a lot of the Marvel episodes. And I was like, Hey, do you want to co-host it? She was like, I would love to, I've been waiting for you to ask me to do this. <laughs> um, so like, it makes it easier for stuff like that. Like, you know, if one of the co-hosts has a sudden deadline, which, you know, that happens, it's up. Oh, we decided you need this in two weeks. Mm. Um, they can be like, Hey, I'm sorry. I can't do these next few episodes. And then I have like four other people I can ask, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, I love that. And like, it's nice as well that um, for all that, you know, as you said, it's a really like, you know, it's a big commitment for someone to step up and be like, right. Yep. I'll be there every single week to match up schedules and everything like that. I mean, as you know, it like, podcasting can be a scheduling nightmare sometimes to get everybody together at the same time but sure is <laughs> yeah right but i love that though i love that you've got different guests on all the time and you know like you get the reoccurring ones and obviously you are like the constant throughout the entire things so, and no, i love it man i love the way that you work that rotation as well it's fantastic and then Thanks. obviously you branched out in where you know you started where you know exclusively you were looking at buffy the vampire slayer and then as you said earlier on you started to do x-men you've, you've done a lot of marvel thing you've done the magicians like you and I recently recorded Harley Quinn. So what was the decision to kind of then branch out more to like more kind of pop culture, like, you know, shows like that? You know, I, <laughs> so the podcast, and this isn't being self-deprecating, this just is what it is. The podcast wasn't that big, right? We, we did well on Twitter. We did well with like queer folks online who are like very online, but not, <laughs> And I just, I mean, for me, I'm a big nerd. And like, <laughs> I've always been, my first job was at a comic book shop in high school. I have other nerdy interests. And I do feel like, you know, we talked about it. X-Men very much intersects with Buffy. Like, mm -hmm. because they are a superhero team, but also they're kind of a chosen family, right? Yeah. So I felt like, oh, but these things do relate. And my other co-host had no interest in like covering other things. And eventually I was like, hey, what if like, you know, how about like Sabrina or like Jessica Jones where it's like other strong women and it's just special one-offs. And Matthew kind of wasn't interested in doing that, which is fine. Like, uh, but once he stepped down, I was like, oh, I can kind of do whatever I want. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I, we had done a few Marvel episodes, like we covered Captain Marvel and Infinity War and those did really well. So I was like, oh, there is like a, a like audience for queer nerds talking about Marvel, even though everyone talks about Marvel, if it's yeah. like a queer point of view, I think that does help make it different. And our Marvel stuff does really well. Mm. Um, you know, Loki, the Loki episode that came out the same week as Conversations with Dead People, they both have the exact same number of streams, which oh, wow. to me is wild because Conversations with Dead People should do better. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, so it's just, it's doing just as well. And I do think they're not the same audience either. Like, oh. There's people who watch the Marvel, like the Marvel stuff has just become so mainstream that I think mm. almost everyone watches it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I kept getting advice from marketing people and stuff saying like, you take too many breaks for your podcast. That's how the numbers dip because then people forget about something if they're not getting it all the time, unless it's like a super famous podcast, then they can take a break. Mm. So kind of like, for better or worse, that's been my, like, especially over the last year, I've been like, no breaks, just <laughs> keep pushing out shit. Cause like when Loki was pushed back or whatever, and like we had that month in between and I was like, oh God, I'm still not back to Buffy and I have nothing <laughs> to do. So I was like, oh, I can still do whatever I want. So I did Magicians, Doom Patrol, Knives Out and Invincible. And like yeah. some of those episodes did nothing. Like Invincible didn't do well and Doom oh, Patrol really? didn't do well. Yeah, I thought Invincible, everyone was like, you should cover Invincible. This seems yeah. like you like would be great at covering it. Like it seems like it would fit your brand. And I was like, these people are right. It does fit my brand. And I was really proud of our episode, but it did not do well. That and oh. Doom Patrol are like our least streamed episodes of the year. Um, but then like the Magicians and Knives Out episodes did do really well. Yeah, I'm really surprised at that because, like, as you know, I do another podcast called Last Week On, which I do with my friend Tom, and we're going through Invincible episode by episode. That does really, really well. And even now, Invincible is like, you know, ended a while back. Right, yeah. yeah. Yes, it does really, really well. I don't know if it's maybe just the episode by episode thing or whatever, but yeah, I mean, we do kind of take a deep dive into the episode. So maybe just people want to go over stuff like that, I guess, and just kind of think, oh, yeah, do they, you know, relate to the episodes in the same way that I do? I don't know. But yeah, like, ours does really well. So it's crazy. Sometimes it's just timing as well, though, right? Like, yeah. there's like ice days and everything like that. It's just, it's crazy. But no, like, I find that fascinating, though, that, that, you know, those two episodes have the same stream to Loki and then conversations with dead people. Right. I mean, 
absolutely insane. But, you know, ride that wave as long as you want. I love it. But, uh, you know, everything that you geek out and branch out into, Ian, like, you know, I think that's why, you know, one of the many reasons why you and I get on so very well, because we have such similar interests, you know, interests and all of that. And like, as soon as I see you upload stuff, I'm like, oh, my God, yes, now we're on board. And yet you still to get me into magicians. I will watch it at some point because I know you're pushing it on me. <laughs> I am. I am like, that is my agenda is pushing the magicians <laughs> on everyone. <laughs> but no, I definitely will. I will watch it in this. And then we will talk about it in depth. But I mean, the I mean, you've seen plenty of Summer Bishel just through my podcast. I mean, she's phenomenal. So I can't wait to see what she brings to the magician. Like, I'm so hyped for that. Like an eye patch and everything, it's happening. But yeah, so I mean, you've done really well with guests as well. I mean, obviously you mentioned earlier on Jada Spencer, you've had Amber Benson. I mean, you've had, you know, Stacey Abrams, you've had Charisma Carpenter. Like we've gone from like, you know, this podcast where it was just like, as you say, you and Matthew and you were talking together. You'd have like an occasional guest on as well. Somebody online who just enjoyed Buffy or whatever it may be. To then landing, I remember Jane has spent in the episode for Pangs, right? So you've got yeah. to talk about that. And then it just kind of evolved from there. And you've done like roundtable episodes as well of like the cast of like, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and everything like that. So how have you gone about like, you know, getting more guests like that? Big guests as well, right? I mean, a thing that I've been doing more recently, which I have like, I was always like afraid to ask people. Mm. Now I'm like are they friends with this person? I'm going to ask. And <laughs> while it can be annoying, I always, am, I always try to be as polite as possible. I'm like, if you're comfortable is what I yeah. always like. Like if you're comfortable, if you have a contact you can share, or if you want to reach out to them, however you're comfortable doing it, if you are cool with it, I would love if you could reach out to X, Y, and Z. I do a lot of, lot of Twitter searching on <laughs> like that person's handle and the word Buffy. Like that's always what I do. Um, and I found like some people that I would have had, that's how I found out. Um, I forget what on the magicians I was watching, but I was like, this feels so Buffy. Oh, you know what? I know what it was. There's a scene where they're talking about Buffy. And I was like, all right, who on the show was a big Buffy fan? Because it was like a moment when they're talking about the trope of, oh, like a baby on a show where they just age it up to a kid because they mm -hmm. just want to. Right. And one, and one person on the show says Buffy, and Summer Bischel's character, Margot, says, actually, Dawn was never a baby. She appeared as a fully-fledged teenager. Yes, love and that. And that's when I was like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> like, this, the person has to have been a very big Buffy fan who wrote this. That's so specific. They must have. Right? Yeah. yeah. To yeah. like, Because I feel like another show, if they weren't big Buffy fans, they might know Dawn, but they might have just said, like, oh, yeah, Buffy was one of the shows that did that. Yeah. And then I like, what I did was I just like Twitter searched a lot of the writers and the like actors. And that's how I found out Summer Bischel herself is a huge Buffy fan. Oh, um, the showrunner was a big Buffy fan. I tried to get her on, but I had no luck. Um, and the guy who wrote the books, Lev Grossman is also a big Buffy fan and I had him on. Um, and it's just been really cool. Like I've kind of taught, I mean, Buzzfeed got me connections, right? Um, but I've kind of taught myself just like how to query with Stacey Abrams. That was the hardest, most work I've ever put into getting a guest. Yeah. Um, it was like six months of emailing. I had to email every email I could find on the Georgia House of Democrats website. Wow. That was like a person that was in something marketing. Two of them emailed me back and were like, oh, I do think she would be very into this. We will circle back to you. And then I would have to circle back to them again in like a few weeks. And they put me in touch with her assistant. And then her assistant put me in touch with her scheduler. And then the answer was no, right? And then they were like, but circle back in uh, 2020 because she is interested. And I kind of thought lots of times when I get those emails, that's just no, but we're being nice about it. Yeah, yeah. But then I, I literally circled back in January of 2020, like three weeks into 2020, and they emailed me back with a date. They're like, all right, we're going to do this date. And I was like, fucking great. I absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. No, it's incredible. And, you know, I mean, you've got some huge names on there. I mean, like Ming Na Wen and like just some incredible actors and like, you know, big presence as well. I mean, Stacey Abrams said it was always incredible. She talks enthusiastically about it as well. But yeah, I just love that. I just love how, you know, you just branch out. You know what? You're just trying it. And if they don't get back to you, well, oh, well. And yeah, going through people that know people, maybe you've uh, had a little word with me at some point, Ian. But uh, <laughs> maybe. But uh, yeah, I love that. And I always get excited when I see like, you know, I, even the Charisma Carpenter episode was really great as well, just to hear her talk and hear these people, especially the actors, talk about their characters because they have such perspective that only they can really talk about in certain ways. 
So it's really nice to dive into, you know, their thoughts on the character and what they thought. And for all that they've done interviews and everything about it, it's so nice to hear them live just talking about it and answering the questions that, you know, you've got there. And then I think, you know, everyone that you've had on that's done that has been incredible with that. Thank you. Yeah, I I mean, they do speak very lovingly, um, especially the Buffy actors, um, which has, you know, I took that brief hiatus from Buffy when all the Joss news came out. But I think the fact that they still speak lovingly about their characters says a lot about how they feel, you know, like charisma clearly still embraces Cordelia. Like she still talks about her and posts stuff about her. Mm -hmm. Um, So if like these folks that went through like working this job that still meant a lot to them, even though their boss was like the worst. Horrendous. Then I feel more okay. Like, okay, then I can still celebrate these characters as well, you know? Yeah, no, 100%. But yes, obviously now the podcast, you know, one thing I love about it, and I love this is, and you're the only person I think that does this that I've seen anyway, is your action figure aesthetic. So, you know, all of those covers, I mean, we've got them going on here as well. But all of those covers that you've got, I mean, literally, I need a coffee book on my coffee table, full of those covers, because they're fantastic. You know what it is? Like, Anyone could just kind of, you know, put like two figures together and say, oh yeah, there's the two figures. There they are. Let's take a photograph. You put so much work and so much effort into it where you just, you can recreate the scenes. You've got like the little dioramas of like, you know, the, the rooms that the characters are in and everything. The work you put into it is incredible. Like when did you start? Like, when did you think like, yeah, like I'll do that. And that'll be like my, you know, kind of marketing to the podcast as it were. Well, I will. I mean, we've talked about this before, but Adam, I really <laughs> appreciate how much you love the covers. Just sometimes... Sometimes I'm like, why the fuck am I doing these? No one cares about these. Like, this is just added extra work. But I almost feel like it's the adult equivalent of playing with my toys. Like, it's Mm. like a way for me to like play with them. But like, you know, I'm just taking photos of them. But I will say as a kid, I was really into photography. um, And I would photograph my toys. Like, that Mm. was a thing I did as a kid. I would like, you know, not well, but it's like, oh, I just put this figure here and then like take a photograph of it and like, I don't know. It was like fun. Like I just liked yeah. doing it. And when we started the podcast, we were like, none of us were artists. Right. And I was like, well, I think I could photograph some of the Buffy figures. And like, that could be like the first picture was because we were three slayers, no waiting. It was just three Buffies in different mm. poses it was like yeah. the photo I took. And it wasn't that great of a photo um, because I, while I am an amateur photographer, like I have a Facebook photo page, um, I used to photograph a lot of stuff at Stonewall when I lived in New York. I didn't know how to photograph small things. Like I didn't know how to do light lights mm. for small things without them looking like totally blown out. Cause if you use the same light you would use for a person, the figure is going to be all light. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it took me a while. And at first it was going to be every season we have one new photo. That was my plan. Um, mm. <laughs> that clearly didn't uh, stick um season one i had the one photo of her just buffy season one outfit standing in the library yeah and then season two was when i started to be like oh well i could do like some different photos and i think season two i still had generic season two buffy haircut posed in the library but for Mm -hmm. some episodes i would do different photos yeah and then by season three it was like nope every episode's getting a new photo i just like (laughs) doing them yeah Um, and i will say to my not credit, the early ones were just what you said. It was what was just a figure standing there. Um, and then I would photograph it. But um, I don't know. I just, I really liked doing it. The first, the first custom I did was that season two Buffy, but because she's wearing the outfit she wears in Bad Eggs. Yeah. That she gets covered in the like tar or whatever it is. And I used an erasable marker and just like put the tar all over her. <laughs> And fun fact, erasable markers don't erase if you do it on an action figure is what I learned. And I was like, fuck, (laughs) because it was the figure that I had on my shelf. And I was like, oh, shit. So I had to buy another one because the marker was like stuck on her. And then I was like, oh, well, now I can use that body and paint it for a different Buffy. And then that kind of like got the ball rolling on. Oh, well, I can I can kind of do this. Yeah. And here we are. I mean, here we are. The detail, I mean, we've got a smoke machine going on. We've got shards of glass and muck everywhere. I mean, look at the conversations with dead people cover itself. I mean, man, like the effort that's gone into that, like, I don't think Joyce has ever looked so bright in her whole entire life. Let's be real for 10 minutes. I mean, <laughs> everything that is, is my new on. favorite cover. That is my new favorite cover. It's awesome. We talked about Slay Fest 98 t-shirts earlier on. Get them on there. Get them all on there. I want a vest at that place. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I, you still got all the pictures, by the way. Do you save them? Like, if you still got them yeah. all as a collection, yeah, cool. 
Get that book out, Ian. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I started with, I think it was like the X-Men episodes where I started mm. being like, oh, I can kind of make these look like comic book covers. And yeah. that's kind of how I view it as mm. I try to make it, if it were a comic book, what would the cover look like yeah. in the realm of what I can photograph, right? Yeah, of um, course. So that's how I try to do it where it's like, I mean, conversations with people clearly is just that scene, but that mm. scene lends itself to like a cover of something. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and like technically in that scene, you you see Dawn, but you don't see her like reaching. And I was just like, oh, that'll make it more like comic booky cover. Um, and that's how I try to view the covers now. I try to make it like, what's like in the realm of comic book covers, how could this episode translate to a cover? Um, and yeah. that's kind of what I would go for. Yeah. And you know what it does? Like every time you see it, you just think, yeah, that's the episode. And yeah, you just knock it out of the park every time, Ian. Go oh, damn you, Chippy, with your skills. <laughs> yeah. So obviously now where we've got the podcast, we've kind of branched out a little bit, haven't we? So we've got the inclusion of My Bloody Judy and My Moody Judy as well. Obviously, latter is Patreon exclusive. As I said before, sign up. But uh, like I do. But uh, yeah, so obviously that is with our mutual friend, Zachary Patton Garcia. So, you know, My Bloody Beauty is very much horror focused where we're looking at like horror films and obviously horror TV shows and everything as well. So like, when did that start? Like, when did that evolution kind of, when you branched out and included that? So Zach and I be started becoming better friends. Um, he found the podcast mm -hmm. um, and I asked him on because I like, he was a popular YouTuber. So I was like, yeah, I totally want this guy on. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, I always joke with him that I was afraid that he was like conservative because he's from the Midwest and, <laughs> you know, has the cowboy aesthetic, but he's, you know, not at all. Yeah, um, not at all. And uh, I had him on with um, Angela Rockstar from Big Brother. And I was like, oh, like, I like the, I like both of them. Both of them were great. Um, and him and I, like both of them, we ended up exchanging phone numbers and texting sometimes. Um, and he and I became closer and we kept saying, oh, we should do something together. Like we have like... I think him and I have really good chemistry, especially because I think we are so different. Yeah. Um, and I think that really works well for both of us. We're so different, but we clearly have love for each other. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like bad different. It's just very different. Like yeah. he's, a, he's a cowboy, he's a walking cowboy hat and I'm a walking Hot Topic ad. Like <laughs> just like not two people you would assume would like get yeah. along so well. Um, and I just thought like, I kept being like, what, what could we do together? We we like bounced around a zillion different ideas before we landed on this. Um, mm -hmm. And at first it was just on his YouTube bonus channel. But then I was like, why don't we just throw the audio up on Slayerfest and we can make it part of like Slayerfest. Yeah. Um, and after a little, little discussing it, we just like landed on, yeah, let's just do that. Um, and yeah, I, I really like doing my bloody Judy. My nudie Judy was actually completely his idea. Okay. Um, and yeah, it, does really well like um the patreon has never never had more income than it has since we started <laughs> uh my nudie judy although i will also say the harley quinn stuff has brought in more subscribers than firefly did we covered firefly oh, now, okay. weirdly that didn't bring in anyone yeah. um which i thought it would because even though at the end of the day i i did enjoy firefly i didn't love it as much as the rabid fan base does but it has such yeah. a rabid fan base i yeah. thought oh this will bring in bed and bring in anyone but harley quinn usually when a new episode drops it brings in like one or two mm. new people per episode which is good yeah definitely no i love that and you know what you're absolutely right about my bloody judy like i love you know everything about that show what you guys do and i, I really i always find it funny how like zach will be really enthusiastic about like a film that he watched and he's like and like ian what did you think and you're like I kind of hated it. <laughs> it's just every time you seem to have a conflict in view. Sometimes, you know, you do kind of, you do, you're on the same page, I was say, in terms of how you both felt about it. But I think in that, that's what makes the show really interesting is that, you know, Zach might talk really like passionately about something, about what he really loved about a certain scene, about particularly you know, like the story elements of like whatever it is that you've watched. And then you might be like, you know what? I just fucking hated it for these reasons, but I do appreciate it for this. And then vice versa as well. You know, you've seen things that you're a bit more passionate about and Zach might be like, mm, I can take or leave that. But yeah, like obviously, you know, you work together because of that, you know, you bounce off each other and that makes the most interesting thing. You could just have a podcast where you just sit and go, yeah, yeah, we both love this. Well, that was 10 minutes. So tune in next time. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's what makes it interesting. You guys obviously are really charismatic you both have a lot of respect and love for each other as well and it's just great to see you know you've got a great thing going on there so now i love my blue judy and obviously my duty judy as well it's just fantastic it's a good laugh you know and it is that that stuff that you know 
it is that bit more risky stuff that you talk about, but I'm here for it. I love it. And obviously sign up for the Patreon, go and see it, go and see what we're talking about. I was very <laughs> proud of that last episode. I, that was, that was the first time I had an idea for nudie Judy and no, the second time, my first idea would like fell flat, but this one, I thought <laughs> we have to tell everyone we had a new uh, photographer who specializes in nude photography. Come on yeah. and like give, I thought very good advice on how to take like the best nudes possible. Um, and Zach and I shared two nudes each, and like, he kind of like gave us critiques that weren't like mean, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was just like, oh, maybe like, yeah, my dick pic had too much empty space. And I was like, mm, he's right. It does have too much empty space. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, okay, sorry. Just like taking notes as the whole thing going forward. So next time I take a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that as well. Like, yeah, it was a really, really fun episode as well. And like the critiques on that, you were just like, all right, okay. So to professionally take one, right. Okay. So this is what I need to do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. Yeah. And like. I, he, I thought he had like really good things to say about like. Of course he did. I wrote them all down. No, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no honestly it did. But it, you know what? It's just a great concept. Again, it's something fresh and just a great idea just to go, yeah, you know what? This thing, like, you know, nudes, whatever it may be, let's just get a professional on who takes like professional photographs of naked people and let's get their view of like our photographs that we've taken. I love that. I ate it up. I thought it was incredible. Plus just you guys as well, just been like, you know what? Here's our pictures. I don't know what you think. <laughs> I just love that. That was fantastic. No, it was a great episode. <laughs> all right, Ian. This is the section that we call Geek Out with the Guest. So before the podcast, I asked you to come up with five, which I think you've come up with times 50, <laughs> <laughs> different moments of basically. So it's moments from like basically queer properties. So it could be from like, you know, it could be a queer character that you love. It could be a scene from a particular queer film. It could be a moment from a queer novel, anything like that. Now, I don't know yours. You don't know mine. However, for our last one, we are going to join, come together and talk about one in particular, which we've kind of hinted at it already. So you'll probably be able to figure it out. But yeah, I think that one's really popular because we both love it so much. So it'd be nice for us just to both talk about that. But yeah. So Ian, would you like to go first? I'm looking at this and I'm like, I have so many things on this list. <laughs> I need to like, I'm trying to think of how I can categorize. Okay. Um, so I guess... I, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna start at the top, but a recent thing, and we already I mentioned this before. Elliot and Margot from The Magicians. Okay. Um, Elliot's the gay character. Margot is like Cordelia Chase, but like if she were written maybe by a woman and like didn't have a crappy end. Yeah. Um, their friendship felt while they are like the cool people. Like when I've interviewed Summer Bishop, I've said like I want to be as cool as Margot, and she said. So do I. Like, <laughs> um, they just, in the final season, by the final season, the two of them became the main characters. Like, I think the showrunners realized, oh, these two have like the star power. And the way they, the way they talk to each other feels, it sounds silly to say in like a world where everyone has like magic powers and whatever, but like, it feels the truest of like gay guy, uh, straight girl, best friendship. Mm. Um, where it's not like, in season one, they are kind of portrayed as like the mean girls, but by season five, they are the fucking heroes. And, yeah. you know, I think of there's this beat in one of the first episodes of the final season where like Elliot is grieving a character that had passed away in the previous season. And Margot says something to him like, you're really pissing me off right now. Cause he's like being a jerk to her. She's like, but I know you're going through some shit. So I'm just going to leave you alone for a little bit. She walks away. And it's fine the next time she sees him. There isn't like a fight. There isn't, it's just mm. back to like, I love yous. Um, mm. In season three, there's a moment when he's leaving and she's afraid he's gonna, it's like, he's going on a quest and she's very afraid that he might die because it's like a dangerous whatever. And they like lovingly kiss on the lips, goodbye. Mm. And it's not, it's never portrayed as like, ooh, is this weird? It's like, yeah. no, they just truly love each other. Yeah. And the way the two of them portrayed like friendship love, I'm very interested in like queer friendships. Yeah. Um, that always like is something I'm rooting for more than like relationships, which probably says something about me, but we won't get into that. <laughs> um, but like their friendship was like one of the most invested friendships I've been in, in a very long time. Yeah. And I just, it was really nice to see that like, those characters easily could just be the mean girls and that's it. But like mm -hmm. showing how much they love each other, like the kissing and the affection they have for one another, like they would hold hands often. Um, reminds me a lot of me and my best friend, Kim. Like that's her and I, like, you know, we, we're like that. 
Um, we're definitely not as cool, but <laughs> you know, like I, I just, it just felt very true to that without making it fetishizing it or anything like that. It just, these are just two characters who love each other and like, it's fine. Yeah. Um, and I don't think we get a lot of that on shows. Like I think if it's the like confident Cordelia Chase type woman with a gay best friend, usually it's like, they're just like, oh, ha 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 ha, you know, like giggly yeah. and say yeah. mean things, but that's it. But these characters, we got to see how much they loved each other. And that was really important to me. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, obviously, you know, I haven't seen The Magicians, but I will. But um, <laughs> what I do enjoy about everything you've just said there, though, it's exactly that. Like, you know, TV shows, we get so much focus on romantic relationships, you know, and that tends to like steer a lot of like the story, basically, of a lot of TV shows where we think, will they, won't they eventually they do to get together? And that is the focus. That's one of the big storylines that we see. When you see a friendship like that done really well, you know, when you strip down, you take away all of that, like, it's not about will they, won't they? They're just really fucking good friends. And it's nice to see a friendship, especially when that's relatable, you know, as you've just said there, like, you know, they, like, the way you and Kim are together, you know, you can find like that relatable. And you're just like, you know what? Yeah, that is a really good friendship and it's really well done. So it's nice that that is a big focus of the TV series. So yeah, I look forward to watching that when I do. I look forward to you giving me a full book report on it. <laughs> oh, believe me, there'll be S's in <laughs> S's on it. <laughs> All right. So my first one is, <clears throat> it's a scene from a film. Now, the film's probably an obvious choice, but it is a certain speech from the film that every time I watch it, I fucking love it. So Wait, can I guess? Yes. I have two that I have on. All right, go for it. Love, Simon, you can exhale now, or the, uh, the Call Me By Your Name speech from the dead. That's the one, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you might have named one of my other ones, but whatever. No, um, but it's not that speech. But anyway, yeah, so it's the speech from his dad. And for me, that speech, the way the actor gives that speech as well is just everything. So I've actually got a little snippet of the speech that I'm going to read. So this is very slayer fest doing a reading. So I'm not going to read the whole speech, but I will read this paragraph of it because I think this just sums it all up. Okay. okay. You had a beautiful friendship, maybe more than a friendship. And I envy you. In my place, most parents would hope the whole thing goes away to pray that their sons land on their feet. But I am not such a parent. In your place, if there is pain, nurse it. If there is a flame, don't snuff it out. Don't be brutal with it. We rip out so much of ourselves to be cured of things faster that we go bankrupt by the age of 30 and have less to offer each time we start with someone new. But to make yourself feel nothing so as to not feel anything, what a waste. Oh, when that landed for me, the first time I hit, like heard that, I was like, are you talking about me? Are you talking straight <laughs> to me? But I think that's so brilliant, you know, like as queer people, Ian, you know, like we hear stuff like that and it's relatable straight away when, you know, like growing up, I mean, obviously you and I have spoken a little bit about this, but I didn't have the best experience kind of growing up as a queer person. And obviously the coming out experience had its moments for me. It's great now, but at the time was really tough. And I think a lot of that, you know, about talking about ripping parts of yourself out, you know, like there's, I think a lot of people, queer people can relate to that, you know, like a lot of that, you know, thinking, you know, you're told that you can't be like that, you can't be that type of person, you've got to rip those parts out of you to therefore be more acceptable to people. And it just hits, you know, it just hits right in the feels. And that's something that makes it so relatable. But what I love about that scene, you know, is his dad is literally breaking it down and saying, look, you're going to be told things like this forget all that shit. Yeah. You know, you will feel pain. That is fine. Like nurse it, go through it. It's a big part of who you are. And this relationship that you have with this guy, go for it. You know, I understand what it is. I know what you're going through. Enjoy it. That is who you are. Embrace that. And I think just to hear that, especially from a father figure at that point in the film is just incredible. It's so well written. Did you enjoy the film? Did you enjoy that bit? Yeah. I, did you read the book? I didn't know. Okay. I didn't love the book that much. Okay. Um, I I will say the movie, I was like, hmm, am I not going to cry until the father gave that speech? Like, mm. I was like, huh, I'm surprised though, because I saw it with a friend who she like is very emotional and she was sobbing the moment they said goodbye. And I was yeah. just like, huh, I usually cry at everything. I'm not crying. This isn't like hitting me. <laughs> but then when the dad gave that speech mm. and then when he's like looking in the fireplace crying, I sobbed straight through like credits. <laughs> and then I was still crying when we walked out of the theater. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's so well delivered. It's brilliant. Apparently, there's two versions of that that the actor went for. So apparently there was a lot more of an emotional version that he went for, but then the director went for the version that we got. And I think the version that we get is just 
perfect. I wouldn't want anything else changed about it. I think that his delivery just with a cigarette, just calmly talking to his son, talking through things. It's what his son needed as well. He didn't need a big emotional like right, outburst yeah. at that point. He just needed to be told, look, this is the situation, son. Embrace who you are. And just so calmly like that. I think, ah. Oh, so well done. I need to watch it again. <laughs> All right, Ian, what is your second choice? I'm like, mm, how do I? <laughs> Which um, one? I, this is like, I feel like whatever, but David and Patrick's wedding from Schitt's Creek. Oh, yes. What a choice. Yeah. Because I would say Alexis and David are like Margot and Elliot. Yeah. Like their growth. Uh, so good. Yeah. And I will say I didn't love the final season of Ships Creek that much. Mm -hmm. um, it felt a lot of like, like circling the drain until the wedding, right? And yeah, I was like, all yeah. right, just like get to the fucking point. Um, yeah. But I loved the finale. Mm -hmm. I loved that Alexis walked him down the aisle and there wasn't, the, the parents weren't upset. It was just, yep, Alexis is walking him down the aisle and that did make sense, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, their dynamic is again, like, Alexis and David and Elio and Margaret, I wrote, I wrote a piece about this because to me, they were like the best queer friendship, like queer straight person friendships I had seen ever probably. Yeah. Um, and I just loved everything about it. I loved that it was a gay wedding, but it wasn't, I don't know, like David was always just queer, right? There was never like, I mean, he, I guess Pan would be more accurate. Yeah, he has that scene when he talks about the wine bowl, doesn't he? Like, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Season, so yeah, yeah. Um, and... I don't know. I, it was it was the finale with a gay wedding with um, Moira crying in that Pope outfit is just <laughs> I've never been consistently laughing and crying so much during a, the scene of television. <laughs> yeah, it's because amazing. it's like you're crying because it's like, oh, this is the moment we've been waiting for. And because Moira's crying, but she's like her voice is going up and down <laughs> because she's trying not to cry. Yeah, I think it's like a perfect scene of television. Mm. And I love as well, like, um, you know, when during the wedding as well when they call it, like do the lyrics of the mariah carey song as well and david's literally trying to hold it together he's like oh my god that is everything <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love that moment what a great choice and again moira like the moment she stepped out in that outfit i was like wow you know what i actually did as well is that i sent my so for mother's day i sent my mom a card and it's actually moira on the front with that in that outfit saying happy mother's day from your baby <laughs> and <laughs> like my mom loves Shits creek as well i got her into it because she loves the actors in Shits creek as well and um yeah like she just started watching it and she was like oh my god this show is everything so i was like that is the mother's day card you were getting and she's still got it now she's like i cannot throw this away <laughs> but no great choice and you know, i love that and Shits creek was great as well with david like you know how we kind of went through that queer narrative with david as well and as you say he was pan as well so you know he had the relationship with stevie at one point and i just love that conversation he has you know I, yeah, talked about there a little bit about the wine bottle. He's like, you know, it's just, I'm not really focused on the label, just, you know, the type of thing I enjoy. And I love that kind of just analogy and just so chill about talking about it with Stevie, I believe it is. But um, yeah, no, I love that. And like, uh, what's his, oh my God, what's his husband called? Patrick, right? Patrick, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Their relationship as well, it starts like business partners and then Patrick clearly has feelings and then they're kind of like flirting and then obviously eventually becomes a moment. But yeah, even when Patrick comes out with his parents as well, it was such a nice, well done scene as well. I even really, when Patrick really... proposes, it's a like. Oh my God, yeah. And even just, you know, like how he's in the worst state ever where he's hurt his foot. Like David's like carrying him up the side of the mountain. And then, yeah, he's like, oh yeah, just reach inside that bag and get this. And by the way, get that. Yeah. And obviously the, the gold rings as well. <laughs> it's just loved it. No, it was really, really well done. And so great that Dan Levy was the one who obviously was there to write a lot of that queer narrative because we need more queer writers writing yeah. queer narratives. So love that. All right, cool, Ian. So. My next one is just a film overall. And this is one film where I love the actress in real life, but I spent 90% of this film fucking hating her. So this is Prayers for Bobby, the Sigourney Weaver film. Have you seen this? Wait, what's it called? Prayers for Bobby. Prayers for, I'm going to look this up on like IMDb. Pray, right like now. prayers, like when you're praying, like prayers for Oh, Bobby. prayers. <laughs> like prayers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, prayers for Bobby. Oh, I feel like I've heard of this. The Ring of Bell? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, I mean, to be honest, like I come from, so when it comes to like Sigourney Weaver, I think of like, you know, Ghostbusters, I think of obviously Alien and Aliens, yeah. you know, like, and I, I love Sigourney Weaver. I mean, as Ripley, like 
she's everything right um but then yeah and then it was my ex at the time was like have you seen this film and I was like no no and like he didn't really know Sigourney Weaver like for he's never seen an alien film which by the way still blew my mind and I changed that immediately <laughs> but um yeah and then he was like oh yeah I know her from this film and I was like what the fresh hell is this and he's like right we'll watch it so do you know anything about the story of it at all Okay, so it's based on a real character, so uh, Mary Griffiths. So basically she had, she was a, a devout Christian and she had a gay son and she spends a lot of the time of the film basically trying to cure her son of his homosexuality um, through the Christian belief. And it gets to the point where, it, I mean, there's some horrendous scenes when literally like he's standing with like his hand on his hip at one point and she's like pushing, you know, his hand off his hips and don't stand like that. You know, she's just horrendous to him throughout the film to the point of when unfortunately he takes his own life. And then, you know, she's trying to understand, like, you know, queerness and homosexuality. And, like, she's going to the church to try and get an answer for it. And, like, even, I think, you know, there's a really interesting scene with a priest when she's trying to talk about it and saying, oh, well, you know, the Bible says this and the Bible says that. And he says, yeah, but the Bible also says that we should stone to death disobedient children. You know, and they have this really interesting conversation. It's like that point when she goes on a kind of self-discovery when she just thinks, right, I need to learn this for myself about homosexuality and like, you know, about queerness and about that culture and just about that sexuality, everything about that, what my son was. And she goes on this big, like, you know, kind of self-discovery. And at the end, she becomes an advocate for gay rights, you know, and she's actually marching in the parade as well at the end. So it's a great story of like a character coming from one perspective to realizing how horrendous she was to the point of where, the horrible disaster of losing her own son to the point where she's really stepped up and now changed her full perspective. It's a fantastic performance by Sigourney Weaver, even though I hated her for most of the film, um, but she's brilliant in it. But also I think it's just, it's a really important film to highlight, you know, how much words, how much, you know, disagreements, how much, you know, just shunning and all of that can have an effect on people. The ultimate result of that was obviously, you know, her own son taking his life, unfortunately. But then, you, you know, you connect that to other things when we look at like, you know, the unfortunate loss of like Caroline Flack, you know, like that online horrendousness of words that were thrown to her and everything like that. And it just, for me, it's a really important film and it shows the effect of if you're going to, you know, segregate and push people out and treat them differently for the way that they are, this is the kind of thing that unfortunately can still happen in modern day society as yeah. well. So for me, it's a really important film for that respect. Huh. Huh. Yeah. Check it out, Ian. Uh, maybe I will. Yeah. Mm, add that to your ever growing list. <laughs> yeah. Adam's <laughs> always giving me things to my list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we need to watch some more stuff together, but we might, might add that to our list. Eh? <laughs> um, all right. Come all right. On. Ian, next one. My next one. I'm trying to like um, a bridge as I'm looking at the list. <laughs> um, Okay, I think I'll just have like honorable mention at the end. But right, okay. um, <laughs> did you? I can't remember if we talked about this. Have you watched the One Day at a Time? The Netflix. It's very good. Ooh. It's very cute. Um, it's like almost too precious, but it's about like a Hispanic family, and they have like a very wacky grandma. So I relate. Um, <laughs> they are Cuban, not Puerto Rican, but okay. still relate. And Rita Moreno plays the grandmother, and she is actually Puerto Rican, not Cuban. So like. She's playing a version of my grandmother that like, <laughs> like she, she is a ver like in the, within the like show, she favors the younger grandson. I am mm. the, I was the youngest grandson. My grandma for sure favored me. Um, <laughs> and the other grand, the granddaughter, she's like, uh-huh, to about, and that's how my grandma was with the other like grandkids. So I relate to that. Um, there's even like a scene in the show at one point when like, so the grandma lives with the family and her daughter's the mom. And the daughter's like getting ready and she's helping her in the kitchen. Mm. And she's handing her things. And she's like, oh, wait, I forgot my phone. And the mom, the grandma's like, here you go. I got it. Here are your keys. And then she hands her something else. And she's like, oh, mommy, I don't need lipstick. And she's like, yes, you do. And my grandma would do that to my mom. Like my grandma would be like, you're going out without makeup on? <laughs> what the hell? Um, wow. So I like related to that show. But then the yeah. daughter, Elena, before she comes out, she gets very invested in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And it's oh, yes. very cute because she like finds it on Netflix and like becomes obsessed and like talks to it all the time with like everyone. And like, mm. that's how a lot of us are with Buffy. Um, and then at the end of the season, she comes out as a lesbian. And in the season finale, it's her quinceanera and the dad who's like kind of like a deadbeat dad comes back because he wants to like get back in with the family but she doesn't want to wear a dress or quinceanera. She wants to wear a suit. Yeah. Dad freaks out. He's like, no, my daughter has to be pretty. She has to wear a dress. And she tells him that he's, she's gay and he leaves. He doesn't want to dance with her at the quinceanera. And the whole thing is that he leaves her and she loves her dad. And she's like, hoping he'll come back. I'm going to cry even talking about it. <laughs> 
But at the end, her dad doesn't come back and he, he leaves because he's so upset that she's gay. He does not come back. He does not go to her quinceanera and she's waiting for him. She wants everyone to wait because she thinks he'll come back and she's crying because he doesn't. And then the whole, ugh, I'm going to cry. The whole family gets up to dance with her and it's very sweet. It's like oh. the grandma and then like everyone like gets up and dances with her. And it's just like such a nice scene. Um, and like so well done because it doesn't, it doesn't, it shows you that like, even if you love a parent, they can still be a complete asshole, right? Like the dad was there. He only came back for the last few episodes in the show. And I don't know. I, I liked that it did that, even though it was like hard for that character. It, it showed you like, oh, like you can have a family member who is completely not going to accept you, but like you have other people that yeah. will. Um, and I thought that was like a really important lesson mm. um, and just like beautifully done because they're all crying and they're all dancing with her. It's like, grandma little brother the mom and like her girlfriend all come up to dance and it's just so sweet and made me oh. cry so much for like a sitcom that's just like a cute sitcom yeah um so like that was like a really big and i you know like being puerto rican i could like relate to like the hispanic family dynamic you know and like yeah. i had never seen that on tv before like mm. but especially like a gay Hispanic teen who's obsessed with Buffy. Like what more could I relate to? <laughs> but literally <laughs> you they know? are writing you into the show. Yeah. I love that. No, I love that. You know, I love that for you as well, Ian, how literally you've got that. But you can just relate on so many different levels there. I love that shit. I'm definitely gonna have to check it out though. Cause that, that last scene sounds amazing. Right up my street. But yeah, remind me to watch that. I will definitely check it out. And she like goes on to become, which I love because I also relate to, she's kind of like the buzzkill where she'll always be the one to be like, no, don't say that. That's problematic, grandma. And they're like, ugh, you think everything. And like, I feel like that's how I am with my family where I'm the like annoying buzzkill one. Um, So I also felt seen in that. I love that. That's kind of me too. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I love that. No, I, that's, you know what? That sounds right of my street. Remind me, I will definitely check that out. I love the sound of that. All right, cool. My next one. So you kind of already gave it away a little bit, Ian. But um, so it's obviously Love, Simon. Now, for me... That was is... on my list too. When I guessed it, I was like, because this is on my list. Yeah. But for me, it's the moment, it's the Jennifer Garner scene. So when, you know, he's, he's standing there and like... That was what know, I said to you. I, <laughs> I that was my I guess. Her... Specifically that scene. <laughs> I thought I misheard you, but okay. So yeah. Okay, Ian, you were right. Let's, just, <laughs> let's address what you want to hear. Oh, I love hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> oh make sure you write that down on the last time i said no i'm joking uh okay so yeah it's that scene now what i love about this scene is it's not just a scene that goes straight into it you know there's a build-up to it and that simon you know he knows that his mom knows at this point and yet she's kind of sitting there and she's writing stuff down and she can feel that her son wants to talk to her and he feels really awkward and he's kind of like standing there and he's like looking at her and then oh i mean what's crazy as well is in the book that the film is based on um, this scene doesn't even happen. You know, he has yeah. a scene with his dad, but I love that Jennifer Garner herself pushed for this scene and wow, what a scene. And she nails this scene, like knocks it out of the park. So obviously, you know, it sits down and he starts talking to her and it's like, it's when she says like the line, you know, you finally get to breathe, Simon. Like, you know, I feel like, you know, you've been holding your breath all this time and you're still the same kid that like, you know, I rely on that, you know, your dad relies on for pretty much everything. And like Jennifer Garner's delivery on that when she's getting emotional, but is still staying strong for her son. And, even like the actors are like, um, even he said like that scene, he just burst out crying because Jennifer Garner is so good in it. And then, yeah, it's that line when she says, you finally get to breathe now, Simon. I remember like even I was getting, when I saw it in the cinema, choked up at that point. I was like, oh my God, that is so right. And it's her delivery. It's just, oh, I love everything about that scene. Uh, well, I saw that with my mom. Because I saw the movie, okay. I saw the movie in previews, like a friend got like a preview ticket and took me and I really liked it mm. and I cried. And then I saw it. I was like, oh, I think my mom will really like this. And I took yeah. my mom and we both cried so much that she held my hand during that scene because I was crying so hard. Man, I love that. <laughs> but um, but yeah. yeah, no, I love, I think that's like a very good scene. Yeah. And I love as well, like even there's more comedic value in the scene with his dad later on, you know, like, and like right. the, the actor as well, you know, when he's literally breaking down, he was recently in Love Victor as well, wasn't he for an episode? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, like even when he's like really trying to hold it together and talk about it and tell his son, like, look, I'm fine with you being gay. And then even just that line, I was thinking about, we signed up for Grindr together. And he's like, yeah, dad about that. <laughs> <laughs> I look like the book that I love that he has a moment with both his parents separately as well. And there's like different dynamics there, but I love that, you know, it's just brilliant. I also love the scene when, you know, 
I mean, he's obsessed with, you know, Brendan Urie from Panic at the Disco, which, hello, Same, I am. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then even just that moment when he's like, <laughs> like embracing this homosexuality, he's like, you know, I can be really gay, I can do this. And just the whole Whitney Houston dance routine, like coming out of the school, <laughs> just absolutely <laughs> love it. I even said to my friends at one point, I was like, post social distancing, this will be me nipping to the shop for a pint of milk and just sent a link to that scene. And they were like, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <Adam." laughs> so like, I love that. All right, Ian, your next choice. Oh God, which one is my next choice? Well, thankfully I can take uh, Love, Simon off my list because yep. you had it. Because um, I literally have that scene. Um, I'm going to go with another friendship. Um, yes. Sex sex Education, uh, yes. Eric and Otis. Oh, friendship. yes. Brilliant um, choice. Very much reminds me of me and my straight best friend, Kevin. Like mm. their dynamic, they're like, they are basically brothers. They like clearly 100% love each other. Yeah. Um, and like support each other. And like they have fights, but they're still family. Yeah. Um, I, that show was a show that like people kept saying, no, you will love this. And I was like, eh, I get like, so like bratty. Same. When people are like, just, you know, every, we love this. You'll love it. You'll love it. I get very, eh. But during like, the peak of quarantine when I was like absorbing lots of TV shows, I was like, all right, I'll give this a shot. And I fucking loved it. I can't wait for the next season. Sure. Um, because I actually, when I interviewed Ming-Na Wen, we talked about sex ed because we both, she was like, oh my God, I love it so much. And I was like, I know. And we were like talking about parts that we love because yeah. I had like just finished it like two weeks before that. Mm. Um, and it was cool. Like I talked about it with her. Um, but yeah, I think they do, their friendship just like so well right yeah no i mean they bounce up to each other so well and support each other so well i love that like you have the episode when i can't remember the artist that we're going to see but like his friends like dressed up really flamboyantly with a wig and everything and like even like you know they both dress up like that like yeah 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 you know it's a huge yeah. like lgbtq artist let's just do this i love that for them you know like whereas other friendships might have been a bit like yeah you go and do your thing i'm fine but i just love that they both love each other and respect each other and know each other inside out they're like yeah you know just do this yeah they're dynamic as well all the way through the season like just they bounce off each other and like you know are just opposites of the same coin honestly i think it's done so well and that like queer storyline as well with the school bully yeah here for it can't wait for more of that <laughs> Although I was very mad that he picked the bully over. Were you? The like, how, is it how, French? Is he French? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. French. yeah. 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 Really? But to be fair, probably because that would be me. I'd pick the guy that was actually really awful over the guy that was just like super nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's a great show. And again, you know, I'm similar with sex education. I had so many of my friends sent me like, Adam, you've got to watch this. Like, it's really good. And I was like, is it just a show like, you know, about this, like really like, you know, how good can it be? And then they're like, no, no, it's like really wholesome, Adam. It's actually really good. And I was like, all right, okay, I'll give it a go. And it is. And then, yeah, it was actually like, yeah, a friend at work. And he was like, Adam, you've got to check this out. And you know, I was like, right, okay, whatever. Like you're the 90th person to say this. And then watching, I was like, this is one of the most wholesome, well-written, incredible shows. Gillian Anderson's in it. That is enough said. And yeah, just, I mean, she's phenomenal in it as well. But yeah, love it. Every character as well is really well realized. It reminds me a lot of me being at school as well, like the very British school aesthetic that the show has. Just, I love it. Yeah, great choice, Ian. Love that choice. <laughs> All right. Uh, so my kind of, this is like our last one before the big one, right? So my last one before we talk about our joint one, this might be a bit of an obvious choice, but I do love certain scenes and one in particular. So, the writer of this show, I find very hit and miss. Some stuff he does really well. Other stuff I find he has good ideas, but they kind of go nowhere, go down a path that I wouldn't take them down. Stephen Moffat or Ryan Murphy? Ryan Murphy. So yeah, it is. <laughs> it is obviously Glee and it's the character of Kurt. So I think there's certain moments. You've obviously watched Glee, right? Uh, I watched the first season. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, well, there's a scene, I think it might be later on, I don't think it's the first season, but so the character of Kurt, I think is really, really well done. And there's a certain scene when, okay, so Kurt's dad is basically getting together with Finn, who was like the football kind of player jock who obviously yeah. joins the Glee, like, you know, the Glee group. And anyway, so his mother gets with Kurt's dad, which obviously puts them together. And then therefore Kurt and then, you know, Finn, the straight jock, are going to become like stepbrothers. And there's a scene when like Kurt's like decorated, they're going to have like a joint bed, like bedroom. So Kurt's like decorated the full bedroom. It's really flamboyant. You know, he's got like shades in and like really like extravagant quilts and everything up and like, so Finn comes in, he comes down, he's like, what the hell? Like, I can't sleep here. Like, I can't get changed here. Like, what the hell is all this? And Kurt's like, I spent all day doing this. Like, you know, I thought you would like it. And he's like, no, I hate it all. And like, it's the argument they have when like, he's basically grabbing stuff. He's like, right, in order to make this better, you can get rid of this baggy lamp 
he can get rid of this faggy quilt. And then it's Kurt's dad who overhears that and comes down. He literally like screams at him. He's like, hey, like, what the hell are you saying? You don't say any of that shit under my roof. And like really stands up for his son and gets right in his face. And, he's, and like, even Finn's like, oh, sorry, you know, like I, I didn't mean it like that. And he's like, no, no, you meant it exactly how you said it. Because we used to say that when I was younger, you know, we used to say on the football team, you know, what are you being such a fag for? We meant it like that, just how you meant it right now. So own that shit and then change it and then kicks him out of the house. And it's just a really nice moment of him, like, you know, the father standing up for his son straight away. So, yeah, it's a great moment. I really, really like that. No, oh, that does sound like a nice moment. <laughs> yeah, you should check it out, Ian. Even just the YouTube video of that scene. <laughs> <sighs> I Ryan Murphy makes me crazy. Um, But <laughs> before we get to our final one, I want to mention some of my honorable mentions. Yeah, definitely go for it. Uh, Will and Grace, just for existing as like the first like mainstream gay sitcom that that did so well. Yes, and I revisiting it. Of course, it has problems. I mean, lots of things do from back then. This really like the problems are very glaring, but I still appreciate it for what yeah. it was. Um, I didn't finish the revival because it wasn't that good. <laughs> um, I really liked it at first, and then I was like, oh, this is what. Mm. As you know, we I could say this because we are not in our 20s but like yeah. it was a little bit too much of like why are they in the exact same place that they were like <laughs> and they're like not yeah. they're like 50 plus like it felt like we didn't get any development and we just kind of like they were stagnant for 20 years yeah. um but i appreciate it for it was karen is like absolutely still oh. a gay icon yeah you know i, I the, the show itself and when i revisited it when it went on hulu for the first time it does feel very New York. Like I watched it as a kid living in the suburbs, but watching it after having lived in New York, it's like, oh, weird. They do mention like bars that are actually real bars. Like anytime Jack performs somewhere, it's like a real place in New York. Oh, nice. Um, granted, every time they go to that place, it's very clearly not that place, yeah. but <laughs> made me appreciate it more. Um, same thing with Seinfeld, like shows like that, where it's like, they are very in New York. I can appreciate mm. them more since I live there. Yeah, definitely. whatever. Um, Shira and Katra on the Shira uh, reboot on Netflix. They kiss okay. at the end. And I truly thought it was going to be a like, ooh, they're queer, but we're never going to show it or say it. Mm. But then they explicitly made them queer. And I like yeah. cried and didn't expect it. Um, <laughs> very good. I recommend the Shira cartoon. And North Star from Marvel Comics coming out in Alpha Flight. Okay. It was a very big deal for me as a child that there was like a gay hero. Mm. I mean, he's like B, C list at best and still doesn't get the due he deserves. Mm. But I appreciate him for being like the first out gay comic book character. Like he explicitly says, I am gay while yeah. fighting with a, a villain. Mm. Um, and I just always think like, we have Wiccan and Hulkling who I love. And now they're like, they're the cool ones. Mm. But I always want North Star. Like I wish North Star could show up in an MCU thing or like, I was hoping that he would show up in the X-Men movies um, because it seems like they kind of let them do whatever the fuck they wanted in those X-Men movies. So like, <laughs> why not have him show up? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just think like, and he's kind of a dick, which I liked. Like he's very self-centered and he's kind of mean. And I like that we're allowed to have a gay character like that. And he's not like punished. Yeah. No, that's really cool. I really love that for you. Yeah. That's really um, but yeah, do you want to do you want to go into our fifth? All right, so we can hold hands on our way into our fifth. <laughs> here we go. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this for me was obvious that Ian and I would have to talk about this because it's from a property that we both love. I mean, we spent like what twenty five minutes talking about it at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> but yeah, so this is obviously the relationship between Willow and Tara from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is going to be really funny because when we talk about it. The American and British divide here is so obvious in that I said Tara and Ian says Tara. So, <laughs> well, like, Giles says Tara and then everyone indeed. else says Tara. So there you yeah. go. So there you go. Um, but yes, so I mean, where do we start, Ian? Like this for me was like, it was landmark at the time. You gotta remember like the time frame that Buffy was out as well. And like, I always come back to one particular moment with their relationship. And I mean, there's so many, but I remember the episode of The Body. So we get that scene, which you're probably not going to talk about, when Willow's freaking out about, you know, changing her outfit like 50 times. Tara's trying to calm her down, and then she just grabs her and just kisses her like three times. I remember seeing that as like a young teen and being like, oh my God, they're actually, they're showing this. And I remember like, as well, like, you know, for, a, for a, you know, like the WB as well, to be like, yeah, you know, we will show that as well. It was a landmark. And it wasn't just the sake of like, we're just showing two women kiss because we're trying to be, you know, 
this type of network. It was just because it made sense for that moment for those characters. And it was just really well written and done. I mean, and I, I even go back to, I know some people will like feel some kind of way, but Willow's coming out was also really good. Yeah. I yeah. appreciate that we got Buffy being weird for five seconds and then she just corrects, right? Yeah. Because I know some people will like say like, oh, Buffy was being problematic, but like also she was supposed to be a teen in like 2000. That yeah. totally tracks hmm. and she corrects herself. Like she's like, I'm not being weird, Will. Ugh. And then she like sees that she is and then corrects and sits down and is like, no, I'm not, like, I'm perfectly fine with this. And then she is. Yeah. Um, mm. That was really important to me showing like, you know, talk, we, I've talked about this a lot with this list, like a queer and a straight person, the friendship they have is very yeah. important to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I grew up not having any other gay friends um, until my other best friend came out, but like the rest of my friends mostly were all straight. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really appreciate well done dynamic between a queer person and a straight person. And Buffy and Willow for me are like the blueprint, like their friendship, you know, Buffy was weird for those five seconds and then corrected and was fine and was sweet about it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like did the like straight person stumble, the like well-meaning straight person stumbling, but like corrected mm. and was from then on, like there was, there was no like weirdness and it just, I don't know. I, I really, really liked the way that coming out was written. Mm. I think Willow and Tara were like just really well done. They really like loved each other. Um, yeah, I don't know. They just like, right. That was such a big deal. And especially on TV in general, but especially genre TV, we didn't often get. No, like not at all. And I think what's great about that coming out as well is that, you know, handled in a modern kind of context, like that scene that like you could have just go for the obvious choice where the straight best friend's just like, all right, okay, cool. And just embraces it straight away. I love that they went for that stumble to start with. And like, it just makes it more engaging when you're kind of watching, you're thinking, whoa, like, is Buffy going to be that person? And then obviously, as you say, she catches up and she's like, no, well, no, absolutely not. It's like, I'm glad you told me, you know, and I love that. And Sarah Michelle Gellar just plays that so well. I mean, both of them in that scene together, they are winning awards for that scene alone. Yeah. <laughs> Even like Willow herself just being like really kind of like going more introvert. And she's like, oh my God, you're freaking. And she's like, no, I'm not. Like, she's like, you are, you're freaking. And you can just see her like literally like going into herself. Like, oh my God, like I'm regretting telling her. And then by the end, it just strengthens their friendship. And we get that later on as well, where, even in, so the episode is of season five is called Family, when like Tara's family turn yeah. up and they try to take her away, calling her a disgusting demon, which was all bullshit anyway. Um, which by the way, sidebar, I love in season four when we see Tara like puts the, like that magic dust under the bed and we don't find out why until that season. Oh, like Buffy's so ahead of its time. But yeah, <laughs> but in that episode, I love as well when it's like, you know, Buffy stands up and says, look, if you want to take her, you're going to have to go through me because she is part of us. You know, she is my best friend's girlfriend, but also I love her a bit. And Willow and Tara have a really great friendship as well. I wish we saw more of that going ahead, you know, and she really trusts her and tells her a lot of things. And oh, Buffy and, Buffy and Tara. Yeah. Buffy and Tara, yeah. Like their yeah, friendship and, together. And you know what? I think, so uh, also Tara and Dawn, like, yeah. you know, uh, Sometimes I would watch the commentary on the DVDs for episodes we recorded. And I remember someone saying on commentary that like Tara was the aunt that Dawn always like needed. She was like the very cool aunt that like was very sweet with her, was very loving, mm. kind of almost understood her outsiderness better than the rest of the Scooby gang did. Yeah. Um, and I talked to Drew Greenberg about that um, when he was on for season six. And he said that was really important to him mm. that when he wrote, willow and or tara and dawn together that they were affectionate because yeah. he felt like he hadn't seen that on tv like a queer person being affectionate with like a child yeah um and i didn't even think about that till he said that and i was like oh shit i think that's probably another first for me like mm. you know there's that episode when like it is his first episode that drew wrote where um buffy and spike fucked the house down right yeah and willow's on her bender so tara has to spend the night at Buffy's house with Dawn because no yeah. one comes home mm. and Dawn is like cuddled up on her asleep on the couch and he said that was so important to him to write yeah. that scene that Dawn was like cuddled on her mm. to like have the audience see like a queer person be like a child be like affectionate in the familial way mm. um, and like now I always go back to that too because that is really important and I hadn't even thought about that aspect Yeah, but he's right especially back then you didn't see that happening no. ever not at all like even like there's always like you know, even sometimes you see a queer character like modern day TV shows and it's just like, they're there to basically, you know, 
tick a stereotype essentially and you're like oh okay yeah, i've seen this deliver but, insults but that's it <laughs> yeah yeah just be really bitchy yeah you know and then that's it off they go all right tick we've got that character whereas you know with taro as well i mean even i always go back to that scene as well when you know buffy's kind of like admitting like you know all of her sexual like encounters that she's had with spike and she's like why do i let him do these horrible things to me and she's literally crying on tara's lap at one point and it just shows like you know she is this person that is so trustworthy and people can go to and talk to and like she is so supportive, you know, she, she gives that level of support and makes people feel comfortable in her presence. Like, you know, you said with Dawn there, you know, she's looking after Dawn, she's being that aunt. And then even with Buffy there, you know, Buffy goes to her and knows that she can put trust in her straight away, that she knows she's got that friendship with her, which is why I wish they had more of that Buffy Tara friendship because it was so strong. Yeah. And then again, you know, just where we start from, you know, like Willow and Tara, we get a lot of the metaphor for the spells they're doing together again, which is like sex scenes, essentially. Right. You know, like all of the heavy breathing and everything. Like maybe like a, a younger Adam might not have caught on to that, but watching back, it's so there. Um, but yeah, like I love all that. And again, we talked about metaphor earlier on. Again, it's beautifully done here with all of the spells and everything like that they do together. And even like once more we're feeling when, you know, we see them riding off the bed. I wonder what's happening there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just think when we go to that point of when, you know, <laughs> spoiler alert for Buffy, but when... Tara is obviously shot and like Willow's saying like no like like baby like no it's just you feel it because you've had the build-up of that relationship from Willow kind of discovering her own sexuality coming out discovering that she has feelings for Tara to then being in love with Tara to then losing her which by the way I'm still not over Tara dying but whatever but yeah it's just it was a it was such a character moment for Willow but as well it was such a moment for their relationship and that it made you believe and understand how strong that relationship which is one of the strongest relationships it possibly be in the entire show yeah yeah I yeah. know whenever anyone talks about like I mean I feel like you and I agree like I don't give a shit about Spike versus Angel like I just truly that conversation <laughs> is so boring to me yeah. and so many people have it in the like mentions of my podcast and I'm like yeah get a new thing to talk about with the show. There's <laughs> way better things to talk about than like Buffy's boyfriend and who was the worst one and who, was... because honestly, I do think Tara and Willow were the best couple. If Xander hadn't left Anya at the altar, they would have been the second best couple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, agreed. Um, but yeah, it was just, you know, it, as we said before, it was landmark at the time. We weren't getting a lot of this. We weren't getting, you know, a queer couple written so well as what they were as well. I mean, each character had their own depth. They weren't just, the gay couple on the show right. you know you can yeah. take each character aside and they have their own you know depth and characteristics and just what they brought separately to the show as well as together especially tara when as the show went on she was very background to start with and then yeah. you know it could have very easily just been that bit of the oz thing where she's the attachment to willow the the main in the series but as the show went on we got so much more of tara as we yeah. said with the relationship with buffy with dawn and everything like that we got to see more of this character which was fantastic but yeah then just for that to carry through obviously to then kind of end with like when she you know was shot in season six right. but yeah for me it's landmark and it's one of the most important stories and relationships of Buffy entirely yeah yeah we need more of it yeah. <laughs> all right Ian so yeah we're just going towards a closing now so I just want to say is there anything any kind of last final thoughts any more comments anything that we haven't discussed that you just want to leave us with it could be about podcasts could be about Buffy which we've talked about loads but there's always more to say but yeah uh, anything that you want to leave you know just anyone who might be thinking they want to start a podcast or anyone who wants to do some writing any little pearls of wisdom from the beautiful Ian mind that you want to leave us with <laughs> from my like mush brain um I don't know uh I would say a podcast is a lot of work and don't start one if you're not like fully committed because it is so much fucking work um there's a lot of like things that go into it that you don't think about like all the stuff you have to figure out with us hosting site and all the stuff you have to figure out with like getting it to other platforms while hosting on a site um and getting guests and like mm -hmm. all of it is a lot of work i would say this is like the most committed relationship i've ever had is me <laughs> and my podcast <laughs> Yeah, no, and you know what, that is fantastic advice as well. I'd say, you know, like if you're researching it to do and it, like do your research, like figure out exactly what you've got to do. Because yeah. man, like, you know, Ian, you're absolutely right. I mean, God, like even even this podcast, like, you know, schedule, even just scheduling, like you and I had to agree a date that we're both free. That can be hell sometimes for people. And then you've got like 70 dates, like, you know, agreed with people and like, oh my God, like, where am I now? And like, you, you do like what, three, four recordings sometimes on the same day. I'm you've doing three got, today. <laughs> yeah, right. There's one straight after this. So, you know, you've got to be ready and just have that pinpointed down exactly right. This is what I'm doing. And just 
understand what you're walking into. And as you said, Ian, which is perfectly right, have the commitment. You know, if you're going to do it, do it 100%. Don't go into 10% and think everything will be fine because it takes up all your goddamn time. <laughs> so, yeah. Ian, my lovely, uh, this is the point where you can pimp all of your socials. So tell me, where can you find everything that you're involved with? You can find SlayerFest98 on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and other places you get podcasts. Um, you can find us on social at SlayerFestX98. We are on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Uh, that's it. Um, and if you want to follow me, I'm at Ian X Carlos on social media. And if you want to support the podcast, we have the Patreon with my nudie Judy and a bunch of other bonus episodes like Adam and I talking about Harley Quinn. Yeah, exactly, which we did recently. So yeah, I have to reiterate that. Go and support Slayfest 98 podcast on Patreon because I do, and it is just fantastic. Obviously, it's one of the best podcasts, and I'm not just saying that because Ian's here. I would tell anyone that. <laughs> but yes, make sure you go and follow Ian and the podcast on all socials immediately. You can find the podcast, so interview podcast. We're on everywhere that you can get podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We are everywhere, so make sure you go and check us out if you don't follow us already and subscribe. We're on all socials as well, so if you just type into you podcast, we are on Twitter, we're on Instagram, you know, just we are everywhere. If you want to follow me, I am Strawn87, so again, that is on everywhere, really, Instagram, Twitter. If you just type that in, you will find my face. So I just want to say a big thank you again, Ian, for taking the time to talk to me about this. I've really enjoyed it, lovely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course, and we'll chat again soon. But yeah, until next time, take care, everyone. Mm-hmm.